Hey, welcome back to Rocky Mountain Readings, where yesterday we finished off the wonderful book, The Thirteen Petaled Rose by Rabbi Aiden Steinsaltz, and that was a bit of a treat in the end when we got to hear the Pata Aliyahu and its explanation. I was just uh, amazed and definitely will be keeping that in my reference uh, material section for sure. Uh, but today we're going to start a new book, and uh, I've chosen uh, Rabbi Akiva, Sage of the Talmud, uh, to go back a couple thousand years. Um, my rabbi, Rabbi Goldberg, did a uh, bit of a presentation about a month ago, three, four weeks ago, uh, in our Genesis class on Rabbi Akiva. And uh, if you're not familiar, Rabbi Akiva li- was born around 50 A.D., and lived till about 120 A.D. or so, um, during the real critical times of the downfall of the um, the uh, Second Temple in in Jerusalem, and uh, he is a bit of a bottleneck where um, the, the the subtitle of this book is called Sage of the Talmud. Uh, because most of the Talmudic, uh, uh, sources came through Rabbi Akiva and his students and, uh, uh, to understand, uh, the framework, uh, just when I was reading the, uh, uh, notes on these, on these books, when I was searching for something new, uh, it doesn't just go into the history, but it does go into uh, some of Rabbi Akiva's teachings, which I'm hoping that will be useful to you. So let's just jump right into this because uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's uh, a little bit longer than the last couple books we've done, but not that much. I think we should be able to finish it in about eight sessions. So uh, let's jump right in uh, to the introduction. Consider for a moment the following thought experiment. Let us think of the Babylonian Talmud not as we usually do, not as a vast compendium of laws, legends, debates, and interpretations, but rather as a massive, multi-volumed, postmodern experimental novel. Wilder than Moby Dick, beyond the imagination of James Joyce, more internally self-referential than anything dreamed up by David Foster Wallace, Hundreds of pages of dialogue, of discussions that start but never end, organized, it seems, on the surface by free association, and filled with hyperlinked cross-references across the wide expanse of its domain. It has no beginning and no conclusion. It just is. It is as if the Talmud expects that you have read it all before you've read a you re- that you've read it all before you've read a single page. In this novel, as in any novel, there are settings. Here there are real places with real names, Jerusalem, Bene Barak, and Tiberias, all in uh, Eretz Israel or the land of Israel, as well as Egypt, Babylonia, and Rome. There are stories, some miraculous, some quite mundane, and there are characters, farmers and merchants, priests and Romans women and children, slaves and free people, and most of all, there are rabbis, rabbis who constantly talk and debate and prod one another to greater feats of argumentation. It is their world, the landscape of rabbis, that most dominates this novel, and amid all this excess, all these words and characters, if we were to ask, who is the hero of this extraordinary book, who is its central figure, I think, despite the vastness of the work, it is not Such a difficult question to answer. It is Rabbi Akiva, a father of the world, as the Jerusalem Talmud calls him. In many ways, Akiva is the apotheosis of the deepest values of rabbinical Judaism, the essential manifestation of Jewish religion that first evolved in the first and second centuries of the Common Era and came to define the nature of Judaism for hundreds of years. And indeed, the essence of rabbinic Judaism, despite its various incarnations and expressions, is what many people mean by Judaism today. This is a religion based on God's Torah and the various interpretations of that Torah as adduced by the rabbis over the course of centuries. The Torah, in this conception, owes its authority to God and, thanks to its divine origins, contains within it myriad possibilities and unimaginable depths. The Torah and the rabbis who interpreted it have laid out a system of commandments called mitzvot that influence virtually every aspect of a person's life. Prayer, festivals, both solemn and joyous, interpersonal ethics, 
rules about eating, matters of civil and criminal law, and much more. The rabbi acts as interpreter of the Torah as well as judge and scholar, preacher and public leader. In Akiva's time, these functions were just beginning to evolve, and some did not manifest themselves for generations. Welcome, Ashley G. Oh, you're in a power outage down there. Yeah, are you in flooding zones? Uh, I hope you're okay, though. I've been thinking about you when I saw on the news the floodings down there. Uh, but, yeah, we hear the floodings have knocked over trees and, and, and electrical lines, and we hope that you're safe. Rabbis, for example, were not leaders of the community. They were, by and large, a fairly small, elite, and separate group. The word rabbi in its etymological core simply means my master and connotes more of the teacher or mentor function of the role in its origins. But the seed of this future were first sown in Akiva's lifetime, and he had much to do with what we have come to know as rabbinic Judaism. As important as these early sages were, I suspect that if today you were to ask someone with even a moderate connection to Judaism to name one rabbi from ancient times, it is unlikely that he or she would come up with any name aside from Akiva. A few might suggest Maimonides, but he is a figure from medieval times, not the ancient world. And others might suggest Hillel, but he essentially is a precursor to Akiva's world and certainly was never called rabbi. Perhaps Akiva's name recognition is related to the fact that he is known from the Passover Haggadah. Or perhaps it is because the story of his death is so disturbingly brutal, or perhaps it is because he appeared as an important figure in so many stories of the early period of Judaism. Stories retold so often that, in the words of the Talmud scholar Beth Berkowitz, they seem to constitute a new Jewish core curriculum. Akiva always seems to be in the middle of the action, whether he is a central player himself or a significant supporting actor. He is the interpreter of Torah so acute that every detail of the text holds secret meanings. If he was not the very first to push interpretation to such heights, he surely was one of the first, and he is certainly the most well-known and imaginative. He becomes the model for Jewish intellectual creativity, at least in its religious form, for almost 2,000 years. More than that, Akiva is the teacher par excellence, the image of what it means to be a rabbi. And finally, in the manner of his dying, tortured to death by the Roman authorities for his insistence on teaching the Torah in public, he became the model for the rest of the Jewish history of what it means to be a martyr. What does it mean to write a biography of a figure from so long ago? And what does the concept of biography mean as we see it played out in the literature of the ancient rabbis? To begin, let us consider the sources of material about Akiva. The times we are speaking of is often called the Rabbinic Period or the Talmudic Age, and it refers more or less to the first six centuries of the Common Era. Akiva's life overlapped the first two centuries of that age. This co coincided with the time of Roman rule in ancient Israel, and Roman rule continued well after his death, and it included two of the most dramatic events in all of Jewish history the Romans' destruction of the Jewish temple and Jerusalem in 70 CE, and the failed revolt against Rome, 132 to 135 CE, led by a figure known as Bar Chukba. The stories about Akiva and his pronouncements about law, ethics, and theology are collected in literary works that came into existence many years after his time. Those works, often called the Oral Torah, since these teachings, teachings were transmitted orally long before they were written down, as opposed to the written Torah, namely the Bible, include, among others, the Mishnah, the first great works of rabbinical Judaism from 220 CE, and the Babylonian Talmud uh, from around 600 CE. The word Talmud means study which incorporates almost the entire Mishnah and its structure as a kind of lengthy expansion and of commentary on the Mishnah. Where the Mishnah is short, pithy, prescriptive, and somewhat elusive as to its intentions, the Talmud is discursive and filled with argumentation and discussion of reasoning. Yet often it is inclusive in its determination of the resolution of the issue at hand. <clears throat> 
In fact, in the rabbinic library, there are two Talmuds. Besides the Babylonian Talmud, abbreviated as B in references, there is the one known in Hebrew as the Talmud Yerushalami, abbreviated as Y in references, translated variously as the Jerusalem Talmud and the Talmud of the Land of Israel, or generally, in older references, the Palestinian Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud, circa 400 CE, is shorter and was composed in the land of Israel, though not in Jerusalem. Because Rabbi Akiva lived in Palestine, texts preserved in the Jerusalem Talmud are particularly relevant to our project here. We can see materials somewhat closer to his own lifetime and traditions emanating from the land of Israel rather than from Babylonia. Of course, all of these works evolved and developed over the course of many years before they reached the form in which we have them today. So giving the works a precise date is somewhat misleading. Aside from scholars, particularly academic scholars, people generally having been far less interested in Jerusalem Talmud throughout Jewish history than the Babylonian Talmud, when we talk about the Talmud, they are almost always referring to the Babylonian Talmud. This is the massive work that students and rabbis have spent generations commenting upon, discussing, debating, and extolling. In addition, there are texts about Akiva found in collections of Midrashim, plural of Midrash, a word meaning search out or interpret, which are commentaries from around 300 CE and onward on the Bible. Akiva was truly a master of Midrash, and many of his interpretive insights and stories about him are found in these collections. Contrary to its popular usage, there is no single work called the Midrash, but rather a variety of ancient uh, anthologies of these teachings. A good portion of the Babylonian Talmud is devoted to debates about Jewish law, civil, criminal, and ritual, but alongside those materials are Midrashic commentaries on biblical passages, discussions of magic and health, uh, parables and many stories about the rabbis themselves. As the study of the Talmud moved into the world of university scholarship, beginning in the 19th century and continuing to our own times, academic scholars began to explore the question, questions that historians generally raise about ancient materials. These approaches, approaches differ enormously from the classical modes of Talmud study found in the religious world of the Bet Midrash the House of Study, or Yeshiva, Talmudic Academy. Among the questions that history-oriented or literary-minded scholars have raised are those relating to the dating of various Talmudic sources and the way that the Talmud was edited and structured. Both Talmuds are organized into large volumes based on the divisions in the Mishnah, called tractates, each of which bears a title that represents the main focus of each book. But discussions, stories, and themes range far and wide and are not well defined by the title of the volume. Indeed, the Hebrew word used for tractate uh, mesechet mes, literally means web, and a web of association and connections is a good description of the Talmudic tractate as one can find. As I quote from Talmudic sources in this book, I first gave the name of the tractate sometimes preceded by the abbreviation Y or B to indicate the Jerusalem or Babylonian Talmud, respectively, followed by a translation of the tractate's name the first time it appears in a chapter and then a page number, for example, Nidarim Vows 62b. Two additional terms will be helpful to know. The sages who were responsible for producing and promulgating the traditions up to and including the Mishnah are known as the Tanim plural of Tana, repeater or teacher. And those responsible for producing the later materials, such as the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds, are known as Amorim, or plural Amor, Amor, Amora, discusser. Hence, the rabbinic period can neatly be neatly divided into two segments, the Tanaic and Amoritic, Amoraic periods. With the redaction of the Mishnah as the watershed event, things, of course, Tanim, uh, a, a plenty, appear in the Amoric works. This literature contains a wide array of materials, heavily emphasizing legal debates and rulings, 
but also including a myriad number of stories, some of the, in the form of parables, some as what we might call cases, and many being narratives about the lives of the rabbis who us utterances fill the pages of these volumes. Thus, many biographical fragments are scattered throughout these works that, pieced together, might give us the life story of Akiva. And for centuries, that is precisely how these stories were viewed as presenting a life story. In the past 40 years or so, however, this traditional understanding has been challenged. Scholars have questioned whether biography is at all the right category to apply to these tales from the rabbinic period. Three questions have been raised about viewing this literature as biography. First, the concept of biography that we have today is closely related to our notion of history. Namely, biography is the factually accurate representation of real events. Of course, biographers can bring various scholarly perspectives to this work. One can be a Freudian biographer or a Marxist-oriented biographer or a biographer with a strong feminist perspective. But these are only the frames that might be applied to the work. The underlying commitment to historical accuracy, as best it can be achieved, drives the biographer's task in all cases. But is that what the rabbis of the past meant by their version of biography storytelling, biographical storytelling? There are times when rabbinic stories do seem very close to real life, but there are also miracle stories or stories that are hardly credible from a historical point of view. What are we to make of a story told in the Babylonian Talmud in which the sage uh, Rabbi uh, Joshua ben Hanina enters into a debate with the emperor of Rome's daughter. And then he cites his source. Or the story uh, which Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai meets the Roman general Vespasian and predicts that Vespasian will soon become the emperor of Rome. He cites the source. Uh, Joshua ben Hanina was Akiva's teacher and Yochanan ben Zakkai was one of the greatest rabbinic teachers at the time of Akiva's youth. Is it all credible that they would have had conversations with Roman generals and the children of emperors? The concern for historical accuracy that we see today as an essential to biography seems not to have been a matter of interest to the ancient storytellers. Thus, a number of contemporary scholars prefer to view the rabbinic tales as closer to literature than they are to biography. Indeed, at times, the individual narrative seems like quite sophisticated and well-wrought short stories with thematic coherence in elements of literary symbolism. The person who probably was most responsible for setting the agenda for new ways to think about rabbinic stories is the influential American Talmud scholar Jacob uh, Neusner. In a lecture delivered in 1980, Neusner laid out a challenge to viewing these narratives as a matter of history. According to uh, Neusner, historians have been asking the wrong question about these tales. Instead of asking what really happened behind a story, the kernel of truth, we should be looking at what these tales tell us about the culture that produced them. These stories are not an account of one-time events, history in the old sense. Rather, they show us the persistent traits of social culture and mind of the rabbinic world. These biographical stories then should be seen as a window onto the world from the past, not a narrative of actual events. We cannot know for sure, in other words, whether this or that ever event ever ha happened in Akiva's life. We can only investigate the cultural meaning of preserving these stories for the future. At around the same time as uh, Neusner was writing in the United States, uh, Yona Frankel, a scholar at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, was offering his own critique of the traditional approach to these stories with a slightly different slant from Neusner's. Rather than Neusner's cultural historical approach to the biographical tales, Frankel takes a much more literary stance. Read them as stories, he says, as works of fiction, not as stories trying to be reliable biography. It is interesting to note that for most of the history of the Talmudic study, certainly in the classic yeshiva, the stories in the pages of the Talmud were considered hardly interesting at all, except perhaps where they indicated the legal practice of a particular rabbi. 
The stories were the parts of the text that one moved through quickly so that one could get to what really mattered. The debates and the arguments and all their subtle detail that seemed to be at the heart of the Talmudic enterprise. But perhaps because we live in a time in which the narrative mode of thinking has become so compelling, those neglected stories of the rabbinic world have gained a great deal of traction among writers and scholars from a broad range of perspectives. The contemporary scholar most associated with work on rabbinic stories is Jeffrey L. Rubinstein, who has laid out in a number of influential and important works a clear-eyed and comprehensive approach to reading these texts. Rabbinic texts, as Rubinstein shows, are wonderfully ambiguous, open to a variety of methodologies and interpretive readings. Rubinstein is not alone in his approaching these materials in this way. Other contemporary scholars bring a similar perspective to the stories about the sages. Following in the footsteps of Neusner and Frankel, these writers relate to the materials not as historical data, but as literary and cultural footprints from the rabbinic past. My reading in this book of the stories about Akiva follows in this same tradition. The second important element to consider is that rabbinic literature does not present coherent, compact, birth-to-death narratives of rabbis' lives. Instead, the stories about Akiva, for example, are scattered throughout the pages of various rabbinical texts. In that way, rabbinic biography is quite unlike another literature from a closely related time period. Greek and Roman biography, particularly as we see it in the works of Plutarch, who lived almost at the same time as Akiva, in his lives, Plutarch gives us a series of short 30 to 50 pages each in English translation, many biographies of great figures of Greek and Roman culture. Of course, I'm not suggesting that Plutarch lives lives hewed to the standard of modern uh, biography either. Plutarch did have an agenda, and no one would claim that his portraits are historically reliable in the modern sense of the word. As one scholar has put it, Plutarch's overriding purpose is to bring out the moral pattern of his hero's career. Plutarch represents only one example of a whole genre of biographical literature from the world of the distant past. As a whole, Rubenstein writes, ancient biographies did not intend to present the true life of their subject, the life as they actually lived. They sought truth in a different sense, eternal truth that the meaning of the life of their subject held for others. The biographers constructed their subjects such that the lives embodied the values they wished to impart to their audience. But what do we get with Plutarch's lives is a series of organized narratives very different from the biographies of the rabbis in the Talmud and other sources that the reader must piece together from disparate strands. Indeed, rather than using the term biography to describe rabbinic literature, we might say that we are presented uh, with anecdotes, fragments of a life. To tell the story of Akiva's life, we must stitch together stories from different parts of rabbinic canon Stories that sometimes contradict one another, that contrast with Plutarch's help, s helps us see in bold relief a critique of rabbinic tales as a biography that might be called the problem of coherence. Let's say that there are 30 stories about a rabbinic figure. There are many more about Akiva. And on top of that, we have legal opinions and teachings identified with the same rabbi. For instance, a story about how the rabbi dealt with a difficult student in class, a story about what time of day the rabbi said particular prayers, an interpretation of a bi biblical verse, a ruling about how a case of property damage should be adjudicated, adjudicated. And these stories come from various places in the map of rabbinic literature. How much can we really say that every story and every teaching attributed to this particular rabbi represents that rabbi's life and views. If we cannot rely on any particular story about any particular rabbi, this argument goes, how can we use these tales to construct a biography? Finally, another challenge about constructing rabbinic biography is related to the sources of information upon which we must rely. <laughs>
Essentially, everything we know about Akiva comes from the internal sources of Judaism, the Mishnah, abbreviated M in references, and Tosefta, a text from around the same time as the Mishnah and similar to it, abbreviated in references. The two Talmuds and the various Midrashim, we don't have Akiva's letters or diaries or household records, tax receipts or shopping lists. Akiva does not appear in official documents of the Roman authorities, nor is he mentioned in virtually any source outside of those within the Jewish world. There is no particular reason to be surprised about this, of course. The Romans paid little attention to the Jewish individuals in Palestine, with a very few notable exceptions. In, in a certain sense, Akiva, like virtually all of his contemporaries, is a man who was not there. Nonetheless, Akiva is to be found throughout rabbinic literature. He's mentioned 1,341 times in the Babylonian Talmud alone and hundreds of times in the Jerusalem Talmud, the Tosefta and the Midrashic works of rabbinic Judaism. When looking at Akiva, we must turn to these texts along with the contextual knowledge that historians and text scholars have provided over the courses of many years of careful research. How we look at these internal Jewish sources will be an important consideration. None of the discussions thus far is meant to say that Akiva was an imaginary figure, like the protagonists of novels. It's hard for me to believe that Akiva, and for that matter, virtually all his contemporaries, was not a real human being. But of course, I cannot prove that he was. Still, the weight of culture and tradition is powerful. I believe that Akiva and the other rabbis in his circle and after him lived in this world as much as I lived in it today. I cannot know whether every story about him and every utterance attributed to him reflects what he did or said, but I do know that the editors who established the texts that have come down to us from long ago chose to preserve certain stories and teachings in Akiva's name, and that despite the complexities of transmission, it is possible to discern a portrait of his life. The more important question is not, did this event really happen, but rather, why was it passed down? And what is it meant to communicate? The question remains, with all these impediments, what does it mean to write biography when biography hardly seems possible? To my mind, the way to think about the present book is to see it as a kind of imagined biography rooted in the best that contemporary scholarship can teach us about rabbinic tales, about Akiva himself, and about the historical context of the world of the rabbis in the first century and half of the first and a half century of the Common Era. This book brings with it a self-reflective stance and requires a certain modesty about the nature of this biographical enterprise. My goal is to consider the stories and teachings in the light of inner consistency on the one hand and a literary sensibility on the other while recognizing that the stories as we have received them cannot be understood naively as definitively factual. I read the stories about Akiva's, Akiva both as aspects of biography and as literary works expressing the culture, values, and religious teachings embedded in their texts. I will call the reader's attention to some of the issues related to the shaping and reshaping of the various texts over time, and I will call upon the work of academic scholars who concern themselves with these matters where they are relevant to our enterprise, but our focus will remain on the figure of Akiva as best we can uncover his life and personality. In order to take serious the insights of contemporary scholarship, I explore Akiva's life through an examination of a variety of rabbinic sources, putting these texts on the table as it were, and reading them closely in comparison and sometimes in contrast with other rabbinic sources. I have chosen to aim at a close reading of these texts because given that Given what we know today about rabbinic biography as a genre, it is impossible to imagine writing a straightforward narrative of Akiva's life in a manner of the classic biography. Akiva, a uh, scholar, saint, and martyr written by Louis Finkelstein uh, some 80 years ago. Finkelstein was a deeply learned scholar as well as a major leader in American Jewish life. His book exhibits his breadth of knowledge, but of course it is very much a work of its time. He did not have the benefit of perspectives on rabbinic tales 
that have emerged in the past quarter century and of the research of the world of ancient Near Eastern cultures that is available to us today. Moreover, Finkelstein's book is palpably shadowed by the Great Depression and the darkening days preceding the Second World War. Today, his book reads more like a piece of historical fiction than a work of scholarship. It is interesting to note that in regard to the life of Akiva has occasioned some fascinating works of of fiction, imagining his life particularly in relationship to the story of the four who entered the orchard, discussed in chapter 6, and imagining his relationship with Bar Chokhba in chapter 7. The most well-known of these fictional treatments is Milton Steinberg's As a Driven Leaf, in which Akiva is a central figure, though not the main protagonist. Steinberg's book is not a great literary work, but it presents a cohesive portrait of the lives of the early rabbis and therefore has been taught with great pedagogic effect in innumerable classrooms since it first appeared in 1939. The Yiddish writer Joseph Opatosho wrote a novelization of Akiva's life called The Last Revolt, focusing on Akiva's supposed connection to Bar Kokhba. Unlike many fictionalized retellings of Akiva's life, Opashu's novel does not end with Akiva's martyrdom, but with his shout of support for Bar Kokhba's messianic revolt. Howard Schwartz, a contemporary American poet and storyteller, published his version of the story in The Four Who Entered Paradise with an additional twist, a thematic commentary by Mark Bergman, who is a contemporary Midrash scholar. The most recent fictionalization is a novel by the Israeli writer Yochi uh, Brandes called Akiva's Orchard. It has not yet been translated into English. Brandes brings inventive recastings of the Akivian stories to a, and a feminist element into the traditional portrait. Doubtless there were, will be more fic, works of fiction as Akiva remains a fascinating figure. It is no accident, I believe, that Akiva has inspired works of fiction, not only because of his importance in Jewish religious history, but also because of the simple fact that so many of the details of his life are unknown and therefore grist for the mill of a novelist. Just take the basic fact of when he lived. Conventionally, one will see that the dates of his life, given as between 50 and 135 CE, but we have no firm data about these numbers. This dating is really only speculation that comes from a bit of extrapolation. Namely, since the story of Kiva's death fits well with the persecutions following the failure of Bar Kokhba's revolt, we explore that in chapter 7, that death would make sense to occur around 135 CE, a historically reliable point close to the Bar Kokhba debacle. If we assume that Akiva lived to be a very old man, we merely subtract an 85-year life from 135 CE, and we have a birth date of 50 CE. It's guesswork and some arithmetic, not a definitive biographical fact. Who were his parents? We know nothing about them, which is not particularly surprising about his mother, given the patriarchal society of ancient times, though some significant females figures appear in rabbinic literature. But we know nothing about his father as well. Akiva is known as Akiva, the son of Joseph. But his father is not described in any rabbinic sources. Despite the fact that if one pursues some books and online websites today, one will be assured that Akiva was the son or descendant of a convert, for which there is no evidence whatsoever. And in fact, as Rubenstein points out, Akiva's name with his patronymic nimic, Akiva ben Yosef, in, a, in Hebrew, is a term that appears only around 12 times in all of many references to Akiva in the Babylonian Talmud. We don't know where Akiva was born and even where he lived in later life. He is sometimes associated with the town of ben Barak, but that association derives from fewer than a handful of passing references in literature. And finally, we do not know where he died or where he is buried. Most sources will state with assurance that he was executed and buried in the northern coastal city of Caesarea. 
But in fact, the actual rabbinical stories about his execution, as we will see in chapter 7, do not mention the place where he died. The place of his death and burial is only a guess and not an established fact. It is not even attested in the Talmudic sources. Indeed, some indeed travel some 50 miles northeast of Caesarea, and you will come to the ancient city of Tiberias, nestled alongside the large freshwater lake called the Kinneret in Hebrew, the Sea of Galilee in English. Here you can be directed to the tomb of Rabbi Akiva, simple stone pillars with a white painted roof. It is uh, a quiet place, open to the air, well situated with a lovely view of the, the Kinneret. Perhaps, even, even perhaps, a place for contemplation. What lies beneath the, the earth here? The actual final resting place of the sage? Historians would be right to cast skeptical eye on such a claim. Yet pilgrims continue to arrive there. Like much about Rabbi Akiva, we remain caught between fact and legend, history and the shared memory of an old culture. So then why Akiva? Why should we care about this figure who lived 2,000 years ago? I think it is because the story of his life is both archetypal and unique. It is easy to be drawn into the tale of his life. Born in poverty, unschooled in his religious tradition, he mocked scholars and disdained them, at least in one telling of his early life. But then a kind of religious revelation comes to him, and he decides that despite his advanced age, he must learn Torah. Starting from the very basics of the alphabet, and this man, enemy of scholars and profoundly ignorant, becomes the greatest rabbi of them all. As we will see in another version of the story, he courts the daughter of a wealthy man who opposes the relationship and wins her heart and eventually the respect of her father through his learning. He is seen as both mystic and practical legal analyst, both theologian, theologian and text interpreter. He disputes with his colleagues in dramatic fashion, yet he is admired and beloved by his peers. And in the end, he becomes the exemplar of Jewish martyrs, executed by the Romans with the Shema, the central confession of Judaism, on his lips. Yeah, Rabbi Goldberg uh, went through this with us uh, right out of the uh, the stories um, in the their oral tradition. Yeah, before we turn to the stories and teachings that map out his life, we begin in chapter 1 by looking at the world into which Akiva was born. What were the realities of the time in which he lived? What were the political and social landscapes that would have been familiar to him? How have historians today come to view the context in which he lived? We begin with those questions. A note on the translation of the texts. I explore a variety of rabbinic sources in this book, all, of course, translations from Hebrew or Aramaic. Some of these translations, like the standard English translation of the Talmud and certain key Midrashic texts published in the middle of the 20th century by uh, Soncino Press, feel linguistically rather old-fashioned. Others that are aimed at an academic audience trade ease of reading for the exactitude scholars require. Such translations will often be filled with brackets, diacritical marks in the transliteration of Hebrew words, and variants reading from divergent manuscript sources. These characteristics, though admirable for their purposes, will not serve the needs of the, a non-specialist reader. By and large, as is conventional practice, quotations from the Hebrew Bible in this book use the current standard English translation. The Tanakh, published by the Jewish Publication Society, with a few small adaptations to fit the context in which the Bible is being quoted. Except where noted, I have translated all other Hebrew texts that were considered here, taking advantage of the resources offered by various existing translations, but trying to find the right combination of accessibility and accuracy. Because I engaged in a kind of literary close reading of many of these texts, I tried to be careful not to prejudice the interpretation by adding elements that don't exist in the original source. Thus, I've tried to keep to a minimum phrases one will sometimes find in the Sonsino translations, such as, he exclaimed, <coughs> where the original simply is, he said. And I have also tried to translate the same word in a consistent fashion at least within an individual passage, so that readers can gauge the significance of the repetitions 
that would be obscured by varying the way a single word is translated. I have made one occasion for the sake of clarity. Rabbinic texts tend to use pronouns, or in the manner of the Hebrew language, pronouns that are embedded within verbs. Rather than repeat the name of the speaker, in the midst of a debate in the Talmud, it can be confusing to read, he said, followed by he said, and another he said. In order to avoid confusion, I have supplied the name of the speaker, except in a very rare case, where it seemed to me that the original text was being intentionally ambiguous. Finally, one of the fascinating things about translating these texts is how quickly one notices the indeterminacy inherent in the nature of Hebrew vocabulary these sources use. Rabbinic Hebrew has a smaller vocabulary than modern English, and therefore it is often difficult to determine which precise English word is appropriate to express the meaning of the text. In English, we simply have a greater variety of words from which to choose. In one text that we will look at in chapter 2, for example, a key word might be translated as carved or hollowed out or engraved upon, and how one views the imprecise word might have a profound effect on how one reads the text. At times we can make a decent guess based on context, but at other times we have to be satisfied with an ambu- ambiguity that holds it its own fascination. Well, welcome Dewey and uh, Running Right. Hope you're still there and enjoying this. Uh, we're now at uh, chapter one, Akiva's World. To understand Akiva's life, we must try to understand something about the world in which he lived. This is not a simple task. However, we are speaking about a time almost 2,000 years ago. And although historians have attempted to reconstruct that landscape, our sources are both constrained and contested. The land of Israel was ruled by the Roman Empire, and Roman sources about Palestine, such as they are, view the world through Roman eyes, especially after the revolts of the Jews against the Romans. We can expect the ruling conqueror to be less than generous about the rebellious people who were conquered. Virtually all Jewish sources date from a long time after the first century of the Common Era, in some cases many hundred years later, and therefore are problematic as historic evidence. The most well-known contemporary information from that period comes from the Jewish historian Josephus, who managed to negotiate the boundaries of the Jewish and Roman worlds in a savvy and successful way. His works, taken with a degree of open-eyed weariness with which we must consider all pre-modern histories, remain a significant passageway into the first century Jewish life. Nonetheless, much remains uncertain, and scholars have argued over the meaning of events as much as they have about the narratives themselves. What was Jewish religious life like? Who were the leaders of the Jewish community? What rituals actually happened in the temple? And what were the practices of ordinary Jews? There is much disagreement about these and many other questions. Still, enough evidence exists for historians to help us make sense of that time, at least in its broad outlines. As I have said, no one knows Akiva's birth date, and one can find a wide range of conjectures. As we have seen, most uh, estimates appear to be to extrapolate back from the story of his death at the end of, Bar Kokhba, of the Bar Kokhba War at 135 and estimate his birth to be around 50 CE. The precise date is not of consequence. Far more important is the shared assumption that Akiva was born before the Great Revolt against Rome in 66 to 70 CE. And therefore lived through what was surely the most cataclysmic event in Jewish history, at least until the Holocaust, the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 CE. Every historical age might be said to be one of crisis and change, but in the story of the Jewish people, no time was more so than the first century of the Common Era. Yeah, I love the way Rabbi Tovia Singer calls it the, the, the end of the Commonwealth. Uh, you got to think of it. It's, it's like the country, even though the people still existed, uh, they no longer had a Commonwealth. But what of the world before the devastating end to the Great Revolt? 
To understand that Milu into which Akiva was born, we must go back to the conquest of Alexander the Great in ancient Near East, more than 300 years before Akiva's time. Alexander died in 323 BCE, and in the aftermath... Right, right, beautiful running right. And in the aftermath of uh, Alexander's death, the territories that he had conquered, including the land of Israel, became the sites for years of conflicts among various warring parties. The descendants of his generals and their dynasties and the descendants of the Jews, known as the Maccabees, later called the Hasmonians, after the supposed ancestor, who in 167 BC threw off the rule of one of the dynasties that emerged from Alexander's followers. This is the story at the heart of the holiday of Hanukkah. The rule of the Hasmoneans was hardly a smooth one. Internal dissension, struggles for leadership, and essentially a full-scale civil war raged for some 30 years. All the while lurking in the background was the great power of the day, Rome, with ambitions for empire far beyond the dreams of any Hasmonean ruler. In the midst of strife and confusion in Palestine, the Roman general Pompey moved into the Near East and captured Jerusalem in 63 BC. This did not end the Hasmonean civil war. Indeed, historians have argued that the internal conflicts with the, in the Roman world exacerbated the situation in Palestine, with various figures in Rome supporting one side or the other in the civil war in Israel. Remember, on the world stage, we are talking about the period in which Julius Caesar defeated this same Pompey in 48 BCE and was himself assassinated in 44 BC. In fact, Mark Antony, uh, Mark Antony, well known to us today, thanks to Shakespeare, makes an appearance in our drama as well. His support of a wily young upstart named Herod led to Herod being named King of the Jews by the Roman Senate in 40 BCE. By 37 BCE, Herod's military victories in Palestine solidified his status. He ruled in the land of Israel for more than 40 years. Herod is an extraordinary, complex, and fascinating character. He was a megalomaniac and paranoid despot, capable of great cruelty and violence. But at the same time, he had a large vision for Israel with both the political connections in Rome and the iron will to realize his ambitions. Hi, Cookie. Hope you're doing well. Perhaps most of all, Herod was a builder, and the products of his building projects are known to us even today. The city of Caesarea on the coast of the north of Israel and the fortress of Herodium and Masada were all part of his building program. But the most important, the grandest building project of Herod's career was the magnificent expansion of the Second Temple in Jerusalem. The first temple had been destroyed during the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., some 80 years later than uh, exiled Jews in Babylonia were allowed to return to Israel to rejoin those who had remained there. A second temple of much diminished size was built, but Herod undertook a vast expansion of both the city and the temple, and he created what he created was one of the greatest public buildings in the entire Roman Empire. Josephus called it a structure more noteworthy than any in the world. In his Jewish Antiquities, chapter 15. During Herod's rule, Jerusalem became what we would call a destination travel site for world Jewry. Jews flocked to the city for great festivals of the litur lit liturgical year. The construction project took decades. In fact, the temple was not completed until well after Herod's death. Thousands of jobs were created by the building enterprise and money flowed into the city through the pilgrim pilgrimage industry. Herod's second temple changed the economic status of Jerusalem. That's a very key point. All that changed, again, as we will see after the Great Revolt, but the Jerusalem that Akiva would have known or heard about in his youth was a wealthy city, a city busy with workers, filled with foreign visitors, and crowned by a magnificent building unlike anything else he would have experienced. <laughs> 
Indeed, it was a cosmopolitan city with Romans and other foreigners, and Jews from both Palestine and the Diaspora living in and visiting it. As one historian has put it, Jerusalem was now the metropolis of all the world Jew world's Jews. In the period before the Great Revolt, then Eretz Israel lived under Roman rule, it was an occupied land with a vassal king, Herod, appointed and controlled by Rome. Through control, or though control may not be the operative word when applied to Herod, but the nature of Roman rule throughout this empire, its empire gave a significant amount of autonomy to local populations, particularly around what we would call religious matters. The Romans were not interested in taking over the temple and imposing their practices and worship on the Jews. The Jews were free to practice their own ways, and all of Jewish practices, none was more understandable to the Romans than the temple cult with its animal sacrifices, incense, and cast of functionaries, the priest and their uh, retinue. All this was standard religious behavior for almost everyone in the ancient world. For us today, a religious practice centered around animal sacrifices, libations, and agriculture offerings is so foreign, perhaps even bizarre, that it is hard to fathom. But the spectacle at the pilgrimage festivals must have been an immense spiritual experience for those who attended. Even in our times, anyone who has ever stood in St. Peter's Square on Christmas morning as the Pope waves to the crowd or has seen photographs of Mecca at the time of the Hajj can get some small sense of what a pilgrimage to the temple must have meant to the Jews of the first century, both within the land of Israel and in the diaspora. And the idea of the temple was equally powerful. This beautiful building that even the Romans admired was truly the appropriate dwelling place for God on earth. The temple stood for the power and reliability of God himself. To grasp the enormity of what its destruction meant to Akiva and the Jews who lived during his times, we must appreciate how central an institution the temple was for all Jewry. Part of that centrality had to do with the leadership class represented by the priests. This was leadership by lineage, not necessarily by marriage. To be a priest, a man had to be born into the priestly line. Given the wealth associated with the temple, alongside the status of the institution, the priest represented a kind of aristocracy among the Jews. Akiva's story is one of a person from a humble background, a kind of counter-reality to that of the priests. <clears throat> there were the beginnings of another institution, the synagogue, while the temple still stood though it is not entirely clear what took place in this new sit setting. Recent scholarship has shown that although synagogues shared certain commonalities with the ancient synagogue, was not a single type of institution. They varied in their roles, par partially depending on geographical location. And here I'm speaking only about synagogues in Palestine. Synagogues in the diaspora had a somewhat different function. Some synagogues were likely to have been places for prayer or public readings of the Torah. Others were for study. Others were for more public buildings used for meetings. Eventually, over the courses of many years, synagogues came to embody all three of these functions, prayer, learning, and assembly, under one roof. But in the time of Akiva, all this was still evolving. Interesting. What did it mean to be a Jew in the years before the destruction of the temple? Of course, the Jews were a nation ruled by a foreign power. In addition, they were a people and must have thought of themselves in that way. Hence, while many Jews lived in Eretz Israel at the time of the destruction, scholars today estimate the population of Palestine to have been around one million, with half of them Jews. A significant Jewish population lived in the diaspora as well, Egypt, Greece, Italy, etc., and there was a shared cultural kinship between the Jews in Eretz Israel and those in other places in the world. Most Jews within Palestine or in the diaspora seem to have followed certain practices. For example, abstaining from work on the seventh day and not eating certain foods such as pork. But beyond these specific practices, Jews shared certain ideological commitments as well. The historian uh, Seth Schwartz sums it up succinctly. If many or most Palestinian Jews had been asked what it was that made them what they were, 
they would likely have answered that it was the worship of their one God in the temple of Jerusalem in accordance with the Torah, the laws of Torah. These three core elements of what it meant to be a Jew, God, temple, and Torah, were all profoundly shaken in the aftermath of the destruction of 70 CE. I have described the flourishing life of Jerusalem during the year, early years of the first century. A blooming economy, a magnificent temple, a complicated but most bearable occupation under the Romans. Then, how did things turn out so badly? Not surprisingly, troubles began with succession issues following the death of Herod in 4 BCE. Although Jerusalem was doing well, the question of leadership was unclear, as Herod's heirs battled among themselves and Rome looked on uneasily. Eventually, Rome decided to shift leadership to Romans, and a series of governors, prefects, or procurators were appointed rather than naming a Jew new Jewish king to succeed Herod. Among that list of Roman rulers was, most famously, Pontius Pilate, who ruled from 26 CE to 36 CE. Pilate, of course, was the Roman governor at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, but he also made a series of either conscious or unconscious blunders in dealing with the Jewish population in general. Pilate was not the only problem, just the most well-known to us today. The procurator who sparked the Great Revolt was uh, Gessius Florus, who took over in 64. According to Josephus, Gessius Florus never omitted any sort of violence, nor any unjust sort of punishment. It was this, Florus, who necessitated us, the Jews, to take up arms against the Romans, while we thought it better to be destroyed at once than by little, little by little. That's written in the Jewish Antiquities, chapter 20. Thus, to follow Josephus, one explanation for the Great Revolt is that it was a product of bad leadership on the parts of the Romans. Where some of the governors could have acted wisely, they instead acted either stupidly or wickedly. But other factors were in play as well. For example, the contemplation or the completion of the temple meant significant unemployment for all workers. It's definitely a bad breeding ground for civil unrest. Another fact described as foaming, fomenting unhappiness among the Jews. Schwartz has argued that aside from bad leadership and economic instability, the very nature of the Jews' exclusivist culture doomed the relationship of Rome and Jerusalem from birth. The Jewish God and Jewish religious practices could not ever be harmonized with those of Rome. Jews were open to a certain level of integration with Roman Moors, knowing Greek or Latin, dressing like Roman, using Roman courts for certain legal matters, but as Schwartz points out, the Jews were never going to fully conform to what the Romans, as is typical of colonists in any age, may have viewed as merely universal. No matter what the causes, the outcome was disastrous. In the year 70 CE, Jerusalem and its temple were destroyed. Thousands of Jews, hundreds of thousands in all likelihood, were killed, and a huge percentage of the population was removed from the country or at the very least displaced from their homes. The destruction of Jerusalem undermined the ideals of God, temple, and Torah that were at the heart of Jewish consciousness and raised the deepest questions imaginable for the Jews of Akiva's time. Where was God and what was God's power in light of the disaster? What is the meaning of worship in a world without a temple? How can the Torah be understood in the aftermath of tragedy? These were among the most powerful issues that would co confront Akiva during his life. We have looked at the realities that dominated the large-scale picture of Akiva's world in the nature of Roman rule in Palestine, the temple in its glory followed by trauma of the great revolt and destruction of the J Jerusalem. Against this backdrop, we see the first stirrings of the phenomenon that we call, we have come to call the rabbis. Of course, we know Akiva as Rabbi Akiva, but how di exactly did the rabbis come into existence? About this question, historians remain unclear. As Schwartz puts it, 
It seems unlikely that the earliest history of the rabbinic movement can be reconstructed. reconstructed. As with any complex historical phenomenon, pinpointing the origins of the history of the rabbis is not a simple task, particularly given the lack of formal documentation from the time. So we should not be surprised that historians disagree about the nature of how the rabbis first came to be. Rabbinic literature has a famous statement that describes its origins. The beginning of the uh, Mishnaic Tractate of Ot, Fathers or Founders, the Ethics of the Fathers, Moses received Torah on Sinai and passed it on to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. Who were these elders? It's not clear. Who were the men of the great assembly? Indeed, was what was the great assembly? This is also not clear. And how exactly do the prophets fit into this? We don't know. The first two chapters of Avot are not so much a recounting of historical as political argument, an attempt to establish the legitimacy of the rabbis. We begin with Moses. Move through Joshua, and soon enough we are meeting the Ur, your history of rabbinic Judaism, the masters Hillel and Shammai, and others, then on to rely to the early rabbi heroes, Yochanan ben Zakkai and his five students, two of whom were the main teachers of Rabbi Akiva, who himself finally appears in the middle of chapter 2 of Tractate of Ot. In other words, the revelation of Torah follows a direct line from God's hand to Moses to the true inheritors of the tradition of Torah, the rabbis. But this history is told from the point of view of the rabbis themselves. How the rabbis actually emerged is a murkier story. The conventional narrative links the origins of the rabbis to the Pharisees. one of the so-called sects that existed within the Jewish community during the Second Temple period. Josephus, most prominently, but there are other sources as well, speaks about three Jewish sects, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The Essenes, a kind of monastic and perhaps apocalyptically oriented group, are often associated with the desert community of Qumran, famous for the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Sadducees were said to be with the temple and the priestly class, and the Pharisees were known for strict adherence to certain religious principles and practices. Unfortunately, the Pharisees have left behind so little material that it is hard to know exactly what they stood for. As the scholar Stephen Freyd puts it, although the rabbi's most immediate intellectual and spiritual forebearers were likely to have been Pharisees, they have left us no surviving writings of any kind. There certainly seems to be some significant connection between the Pharise what the Pharisees were and what the rabbis became. But the direct and clear linkage scholars once assumed is now viewed as considerably more nuanced and complex. Indeed, it is interesting to note that at no point in antiquity did the rabbis clearly see themselves as either Pharisees or as descendants of the Pharisees, who were the rabbis in the original formation. Most likely, Schwartz suggests the battered, dra 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 drastically reduced remnant of the large pre-destruction class of legal religious functionaries, many of whom were probably priests and or sectarians, to the extent that they began to coalesce into an organization within a few decades of 70. It was more likely uh, from a sense of uh, need for mutual support than in the pursuit hold on one second Yeah, after the destruction, one of the, from my understanding, is that uh, one of the great scholars established uh, uh, in Yavne, uh, first kind of yeshiva, 
system and yeah. Okay. A scheme to preserve Judaism in the absence of a temple, an intention often anachronistically ascribed to them by modern scholars. This conception is directly related to the way that current day scholars have been rethinking the nature and importance of the sex. To us, the word sex seems to refer to almost to a cult, something out of, a, out of the mainstream. But does that represent what the early Jewish sects were? Perhaps the sects were more like voluntary associations that one joined. And most importantly, were the various groups really so different from one another? The trend in scholarship nowadays takes a different stance from the older view of factions in conflict, stressing instead the strength of the core ideology of Judaism, powerful devotion, which united the sectarians, even as disagreement over details of interpretation divided them. In the concept of the newer historians, then Jewish life at the time before the destruction of the temple was not fragmented by sectarianism and was much more unified and centralized than was previously supposed. It was the disaster of 70 CE that threw Jewish life into disarray and that chaos was not calmed by the rabbis coming to the rescue, at least not for a very long time. Instead, the rabbis started out as a small and self-enclosed group, creating a culture that would eventually blossom into what we now call rabbinic Judaism. The approach of recent historian, historians is clear and succinctly summarized by the Talmud scholar Beth Berkowitz. <coughs> Following the destruction wrought by the Great Revolt, the sages coalesced amongst, among the shards. While historians disagree about the variety of issues at the same time, they share a vision of these sages. The earliest rabbis, dating to the late 1st century and 2nd century, as a small, informally organized group struggling for authority in a political structure in which their exercise of power depended solely on persuasion. The sages were an exclusive and separatist clan, ambivalent about their relationship to the majority of the more accultured Jews, who were in turn ambivalent towards the most often simply ignorant of the small group of rabbis living legislating and studying in their largely Greco-Romanized, paganized midst. The power of the rabbis as we know it from medieval period is no longer taken for granted in the Tanaic era, which is newly conceived as an intensely formative period in the development of the rabbis, rather than an institutionalized religious hegemony who rallied the Jewish community around their interpretive authority. The rabbis were much more likely to have been an embattled, almost invisible sect within 2nd century Judaism. Berkowitz describes the world in which Akiva lived as his life. He was part, indeed, crucially central part of that small and formally organized group aiming to envision a relationship to Torah in the light of the tragedy that had struck the community. Perhaps the power of persuasion is precisely what Akiva offered with his creative interpretive genius. Having explored in brief the complicated stories, uh, story of the, of the origins of that group of individuals we call the rabbis, what might we surmise about them? Who were they and what characterized their world? When we hear the term rabbi today, it brings to mind a number of different and related images. These have been fashioned by our own experiences, our reading and representations of rabbis in popular culture. First and foremost, we associate rabbis with synagogues, although today there certainly are rabbis who are employed in other arenas. Still, although not every rabbi works in a synagogue, very few synagogues don't have a rabbi. Within the world of the synagogue, broadly defined, rabbis perform or lead important rituals, marriage, burial, naming of babies, for their congregants' life events. Second, we think of rabbis, like doctors or lawyers, as professionals who have received a structured and formal kind of training. They have sat in classes and taken examinations or written papers to graduate with rabbinical ordination. They may have studied in a liberal seminary or an orthodox yeshiva, but they have been through a course of study determined by standards and traditions. Third, we think of rabbis as spiritual and intellectual leaders of Jewish community. They have attained status through their role and through their achievements. Fourth, rabbis provide pastoral care. They counsel couples before or during marriage, visit the sick, and look after their communities in a variety of ways. 
Finally, in some sectors of the Jewish community, generally the Orthodox world, but this applies to the liberal Jewish community as well, rabbis are judges. They help educate matters of religious practice or civil disputes using the framework of Jewish law and precedent. Although these elements are very familiar to us today, virtually none of them obtained in Akiva's world. To begin with, let us get a sense of numbers. By reading rabbinic literature, one might feel that there were enormous numbers of rabbis, but in fact, the count is actually rather small. The reader of rabbinic texts may imagine a large number of simp- large numbers simply because of these sources, particularly of the Babylonian Talmud. We'll play side by side on the same page rabbis who lived at a very different times and places. The generational count is obscured by merging all the rabbis across hundreds of years into one large pool. But simple, a simple exercise of looking at the specific rabbis who appear in the Mishnah reveals a grand total of 54 who lived more or less at the same time of Akiva. Wow. That's why I called it a bottleneck at the beginning. Of course, this is only a rough method. There may well have been rabbis whose words were simply not recorded by the Mishnah, for example, but even this unsophisticated method is clear that we are talking about a tiny population. Thus, the rabbis during the early period were small and insulated group, found more in towns and villages than in cities. They were not interested in spreading their teachings to the masses. In fact, they looked down on the masses, as we can see from numerous rabbinic statements about other Jews who wasted their time in foolish pursuits rather than studying Torah. Much of that disregard may have emanated from the fact that, by and large, scholars have argued that the early rabbis came from the wealthy tier of Palestinian Jewish society, or at least those one notch down from the top. This perspective differs markedly from the older view of scholars who identified the earliest rabbis as plebeians, to use Louis Frankelstein's term. Indeed, the humble origins of Akiva is all the more remarkable given the rabbinic world that he entered. More importantly, the rabbis did not create the institutions, such as schools for Torah learning, that one would expect from a group interested in spreading its teachings. As the historian Shea Cohen has put it, They had little inclination and availed themselves for a few opportunities to propagate their way of life among the masses. Their judicial authority extended to a few circumscribed topics only. The rabbis were but a small part of Jewish society, an insular group which produced an insular literature. One of the oddities here is that the rabbis of Akiva's time believed in an ideology that required Torah study as obligatory on all, but they did not create an infrastructure to allow this to happen. What was the environment in which the rabbis' own Torah study took place? Rabbinic literature uses a number of different terms for the place in which rabbinic discussions and debates occurred, the two most well-known being the Bet Midrash, literally house of study, and yeshiva, literally sitting place, the rabbinic academy. Traditional scholarship always viewed the Bet Midrash or yeshiva as a formal institution much as we would view a school today. Namely, in that standard view, it was led by a rabbi or rabbis. It had a kind of formal curriculum, and the students more or less enrolled and in many cases were themselves ordained as rabbis after their course of study. Recent scholarship has raised significant questions about these assumptions. In a path-breaking book some years ago, the historian uh, David Goodblatt investigated the sources about the settings for Jewish learning in Babylonian Babylonia during the Sassanid, Sassanian Empire. The Sassanid dynasty ruled Babylon from the early 3rd century until the mid-7th century, essentially the same period of the Babylonian Talmud. He concluded that large stable academies, or yeshivot, came into existence only at a considerably later period, and that the Babylonian Jewish community was characterized by by what Goodblatt calls disciple circles. A disciple circle was not a school. A school, Goodblatt writes, has a staff, a curriculum, and most important, a life of its own, a corporate identity. Students come and go, teachers leave and are replaced, the head of the school dies and a new one is appointed. The institution goes on. A disciple circle, on the other hand, 
does not transcend its principles. Disciples meet with the master and study with him. When the master dies, the disciple circle disbands. What I have in mind is a relationship similar to that group of apprentices and master craftsmen. Later rabbinic sources which gave us the image of a formal institution much like a school are only projecting back into the past the world of these later sources, viewing the past through the lens of the present in the manner of a 16th or 17th century Dutch painting of a biblical scene that has windmills in the background. In Goodblatt's view, the academy is a post-Talmudic phenomenon. Instead, he sees disciple circles that met informally, though there might have been a special building in which the disciple circle met more often than not, we should imagine these discussions taking place in the home of a master or of a wealthy individual who gave the teacher space for his classes. Goodblatt's theory, with some modifications, has by and large stood the test of time. But what the research on the study hall in Babylonia leaves unclear is what the Bet Midrash may have looked like years before in Palestine during Akiva's time, where... There were there formal institutions of learning as suggested in some of the stories about Akiva, or were these also anachronistic, anachronistic framings by the later edited Talmudic sources, the fictive uh, retrojection of institutions back into a formative age? The historian Catherine Hezer comes to a conclusion about Palestine similar to Goodblatt's view of Babylonia. Study houses in the Roman Palestine seem to have been rooms in private houses or apartments or public buildings where people customarily met to study. There is no reason to assume that study houses, houses of meeting, or halls were rabbinic academies. Those study houses, which were associated with, particular, with a particular rabbi, would have ceased to exist with that rabbi's death. Study houses do not, do not seem to have been particularly organized at all. Given the rabbi's insularity, it should not be surprising to us that the rabbis in the first and second centuries were not what today we would call communal leaders. The the association of rabbi and synagogue that seems so obvious to us today did not develop until many years after Akiva's death, perhaps beginning only in the third century of the Common Era and evolving slowly over time. It would not have occurred to Akiva that his role as rabbi should have anything to do with a synagogue. More surprising, as Shea Cohen shows, rabbis did not seem to have a particularly important role as judges. Examination of the literature before 200 CE suggests that rabbinic judges only saw a small number of cases, and most of those dealt with fairly obscure issues, such as matters of ritual purity. They had little to do with civil cases and surprisingly little to do with matters about which we might have expected them to provide leadership, such as observing the Sabbath and eating kosher foods. The beginnings of the change in the role of the rabbis in the direction of what seems more natural to us today are usually attributed to the influence of Rabbi Judah the Patriarch, often translated as Judah the Prince who lived a few generations after Rabbi Akiva. In fact, a a rabbinic tradition in the Talmud reports that he was born on the day that Akiva died. If not historically accurate, this tradition certainly expresses the Talmudic notion of a chain of great leadership, and an idea that one often sees in rabbinic literature. Rabbi Judah expounded the reach of the rabbis into the cities, in tune with the greater urbanization of Palestine. Zippori, or Sepphoris, Lod, and Lydia, Tiberias, and other cities became centers for Jewish study. He found ways to take a wider range of social classes into the rabbinic group, and he had the full support of the Roman authorities so that rabbis actually came to be seen as leaders of their community. But all this developed years after the life of Akiva. In Akiva's time, it is fair to say that there were no rabbinic movement, there was no rabbinic movement as we might have supposed. Hezer captures what is likely to have been the reality of the time. The rabbinic movement may be best described as an informal network of relationships which constituted a personal alliance system. Rabbis seem to have maintained intimate friendship ties with 
small circles of colleagues whom they met on various informal occasions. They seemed to have visited their rabbinic friends at home, shared their meals with them, attended their family ceremonies, and traveled with them to baths and markets. Discussion of Torah may have taken place at any of these social occasions. In essence, then, for Akiva and his colleagues, the rabbis were simply a small circle of friends. The movement was to develop later on over the centuries, but with but its beginnings can be seen in the lives of Akiva and his colleagues. With this background in mind, we now turn the stories to the stories of Akiva's origin. Hold on. One second, folks. Sorry. Yeah, Yochanan uh, Ben Zakai, uh, who was uh, one of Akiva's. Uh, 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 teachers uh, that this book mentioned, um, yeah, after the destruction of the temple, um, yeah, founded the, the, the academy in Yavne. And so I think there's some precedence. So I'm just trying to get a feel for this author, uh, Barry W. Holtz, which, you know, I've got no, I uh, can't get a ton of background on line so it's got to me a uh, texture of uh, academic or christian influence i don't know but i mean so far i mean it's it's decently written so we will continue um with uh, chapter two uh, a self-created sage tomorrow i don't know if i like the the flavor of this it comes down to questions of authority and uh any of you that have sat in with uh, our Rabbi Moshe Shulman's uh, uh, Noahide Path group, I mean, he takes it all the way back uh, uh, to the authority granted out of um, the Torah uh, to the leaders. Um, and, uh, yeah, trying to understand uh, authority. But I'll give, it a, I'll give it a couple more chapters, and if it's still got uh, almost anti-Semitic uh, flavor... Yeah, Dan, um, yeah, that's the way uh, the rabbis have explained it to me as well. Uh, um, yeah, in uh, um, Jethro, uh, yeah, telling Moses to appoint uh, leaders. And so, yeah, that's where we draw Torah uh, understanding of authority granted. But this is given a, some of some some vibes i don't want to throw a baby out with the bathwater, um but i'm not getting a lot of feedback for suggestions from the group uh, following along so uh i i uh, i'm so busy of late uh, i did spend a few hours before i selected this book looking for uh, a book and um i find it's uh it's uh uh, Rabbi Akiva is an interesting character I want to know more about, so I'll give this a little longer and see how it's, uh, it stands. I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't want to write anything off too soon. I want to see if there's some nuggets of truth in there, but it's definitely a change of pace from uh, what we were reading yesterday uh, from uh, uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz. But um, it's interesting. Let's give it another day. So I will be back tomorrow, same time, and we'll continue with uh, uh, chapter two. Um, and uh, hopefully you enjoy it. If anybody's got any comments or suggestions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. I'll do my best to uh, uh, try to come up with something decent. And uh, yeah, I would uh, prefer 
the authoritative uh, chain to be painted uh, in the imagery. It sounds more academic than anything, but we'll give it a little longer and see. And uh, uh, who knows? Hashem may be blessed or bless us, and uh, uh, may we learn something that we can uh, 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 give Him glory along the way in our life's journey. So, yeah. So, till tomorrow, have a wonderful, wonderful day, everybody. Bye for now. 